I'm privileged to introduce a keynote speaker, Greg Hunter. Greg Hunter came from an unchurched home. Guess where his life was changed? In camp. He's <laughs> a very smart guy. <laughs> As you see in our brochure, he's the president and CEO of Christian Camp and Conference Association. And he has all these uh, big responsibilities and long words that he's supposed to do. I don't know if he does that, but it looks good in writing. <laughs> we met this morning, and I feel comfortable enough to <laughs> tease him already. So, Greg, we welcome you. Come, please. Thank you, Jeffrey. It's an honor to be here and a pleasure to look out at uh, your wonderful faces, the faces of people who do Christian camp ministry. As, as Jeffrey said, I grew up in a home where uh, we didn't go to church, didn't talk about God, didn't pray, a pretty, pretty moral home. My, my dad was a police officer and a deputy sheriff, uh, became the sheriff of the county where I lived. But I was a rebellious young man, uh, the youngest of three boys who didn't feel very loved or accepted at home. And so I acted out my anger and rebellion in many ways that kids do today still. Um, but it was getting away for an experience at camp, my first camp experience ever at 17. And uh, it was a camp in beautiful British Columbia where apart from my friends, Apart from my family, apart from even the pressure I put on myself to maintain the character that I had become. Because that's really what I was. I was acting my way through life trying to be somebody that I really wasn't meant to be. But it was in this beautiful, pristine setting like many of you get to live in and work in and serve in every day. Where I heard the voice of God saying, I love you. And for a kid whose own father had never said the words, I love you, it was like water uh, to, to, a, to a thirsty flower in the desert. And I responded to the love of Christ at camp, gave my life to him. And my wife, who knew me before, uh, said it was a, a pancake conversion. She said, you even looked different when you came back from camp. Of course, my wife was my young life leader. And she was in college. I was in high school. And she had to endure my perpetual asking her out. And flirting with her, and she would actually, she said this, she said, when I would go to the high school to do contact work with the kids, I would pray, God, please don't let Greg Hunter be there. <laughs> I think someday she still might, no, no, she probably, probably doesn't. <laughs> I'm just being honest, right, if we can't be honest here with each other. So, um, I, I love camp. I, I, I get to serve camp. I, I've had a career in business that you can read about in, in ministry, and, and now I have the wonderful privilege of serving the ministries of people who do the work that introduce kids like me to Jesus. And so it's a privilege to be in that role. 3CA, I know there are many members here, but, um, but 3CA, as we call ourselves, is, is now made up of about 850 member camps across all denominations and independent church-owned and, and uh, independently operated camps. And so every day, the staff and I get to get up and go into the office in the morning and try to fulfill our mission, which is to maximize ministry for member camps and conference centers. So it's in that context that I get to come to you today. And it's a, a great theme that you've chosen for this conference, the onward theme, and particularly today going forward. Um, in order for us to be fully prepared to go forward, I think we need to have a plan for what we're going to do when we face obstacles. So I'm going to talk about three spiritual disciplines, three things we can do when we face obstacles or storms of life. I don't know about you, but I don't like getting bad news. I mean, who, who enjoys bad news? I have two sons, and, and bad news might be a text from your teenage son that says, Dad, it's about the car. <laughs> might be your boss who says uh, with a stern expression, I need to see you in my office for a minute. Your spouse might say, if you're married, uh, we need to talk. 
I tell my wife sometimes that um, my parents who are in Idaho, wh where I was born, now live in Colorado, uh, when I see the caller ID from my aging parents' phone, it, it, there's a little something that happens. You, you, you know that if you have aging parents, you get, get that little something, you say, I wonder if everybody's okay. All of those things can imply impending bad news. Something is about to happen. Something, you're, you're going to get some news. Well, somehow I find that it's not even better when the bad news comes from the mouth of Jesus. He said this, this wonderful statement. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. It's a guarantee. In John 16, in context... Jesus has just told his disciples that he'll be going away, that he'll be gone for a while, and then he'll come back, referring to his crucifixion and his resurrection. And, and then he answered their question before they asked, which led them to say, wow, you, you knew what we wanted to know before we even asked you. Because of this, we know that you're from God. Jesus, in my paraphrase, says, that's, that's great. I'm glad you believe, but a tough time is coming. When you'll be scattered and you'll leave me alone, but I won't really be alone. And then he said that great promise, my least favorite Bible promise. Everybody asks, what's your favorite verse? How about what's your least favorite verse? Here it comes. In this world, you will have trouble. Let's pray. <laughs> we'll, we'll pray in just a minute. <laughs> you know, it, because it's a promise from the mouth of Jesus, we, we, we are guaranteed. And we know we live in a fallen world, and so we're going to have trouble. Another word for it in the older translations was, in this world you'll have tribulation, which sounds even a little more serious, a little more ominous. In this world you will have tribulation. Then why are we surprised sometimes when things don't go our way? Why are we surprised when maybe people don't like us? We talked about the brothers and sisters who might tell us a little bit what they think of us. You know what, I, I've seen an attitude in you. Why are we surprised when there's even opposition, maybe to our employment, maybe to the visions that we have, the projects that we want to do, the things that we want to do? Why are we surprised maybe when, when the bookings don't come in the way we expected them to, when the way we've been planning, hoping, even budgeting? We're going to look this morning at, at someone in trouble, in a moment of trouble, and it's in a very familiar passage, and the risk, of course, of Looking at a familiar passage of scripture is that we've seen it so many times, uh, we, we could overlook some of the detail, like driving on a familiar road to work every day. We might not see some things. So we're going to dive into a bit more detail, and hopefully we'll notice some things we may have missed before. Now, let's pray. Father, we're grateful for your word. We're grateful for your presence through your Holy Spirit. We simply pray this morning that you would surprise us perhaps with things that we may have overlooked before, but then also you would equip us to move onward, to move forward through the challenges that will inevitably come our way because you promised in this world we'll have trouble. So we give this time to you. Pray that you would bless your word in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have a copy of your scriptures with you, you could turn to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew 14 is uh, the place where the feeding of the 5,000 is recorded. And in verse 21, it, it says that the number of those who, who ate was 5,000 men and women, in addition to women and children. And then the story takes place that we've heard many times before. It's, it starts in verse 22, Matthew 14, verse 22. It says this, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by wind, uh, by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, 
he was afraid and, beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. Jesus said, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Now, Peter's response to the storm really was twofold, wasn't it? His first uh, response was, curse the storm, I'm going to Jesus, which is kind of a cool response. His second response was, holy moly, I'm going to die. His eyes were on Christ, he walked on water. His eyes were on the storm, he began to sink. First, I have to say this about Peter. You know, he's the one to whom Jesus said, you have little faith. And he gets kind of a bad rap, I think. I think it took great courage for him to get out of the boat. Where were the other 11? They were in the boat where it was safe. I'm the youngest of three sons, as I said. Are there any other youngest children? Right? A lot of youngest children. Now, what would you have done if your brother or sister had jumped out of the boat and gone toward Jesus? If you were like me, you'd say, I want to go. How come he gets to have all the fun? (laughs) Right? Well, Peter wasn't even a youngest, uh, we don't think. Um, So so I would have wanted to be out there too. But have you been on the water at night in a boat? How many of you have been on the water at night? Did you ever get out of the boat into the water at night? No. Why? It's dark and it's scary and it's black. And my, my family had a boat for a little while while I was growing up. And a couple of times, my brothers and I jumped out of the boat in, in the water at night. And you're wondering, while you're in midair, did the water suddenly become one inch deep? <laughs> or do you think those legends are true about the animals that live in the Snake River? So there's something kind of scary. And that's not during a storm. Remember, the, the, the passage said, that they were a considerable way from shore, but that the boat wasn't making much headway because the waves were against it. So there was a pretty good wind going, and yet Peter says, Lord, if it's you, which tells me he couldn't quite see him, he said, if it's you, tell me to come out to you. Can you imagine him throwing his leg over and kind of testing like this and see if it would hold him up? Well, then something happened, and he took his eyes off the Lord, and he began to sink. I'd like to make this practical, to say here at 2015, St. Simon's Island, Epworth by the Sea, what are the storms that we face that take our attention off of Christ and what he's called us to and what causes us to sink? Maybe our storm is not life or death, but maybe it is. In a, in a room this size with this many people, maybe you have faced life or death, death storms. But those things that can bring the feeling of panic and desperation or pain, they can, again, can cause us to look at that thing like Peter, was, or the, like, uh, yeah, like Peter was looking at the waves. What's beating you up? Is there anything that's causing you to le- lose sleep at night? Is there something that causes you stress? Something you're praying about but maybe not, not enough? And you're looking for that peace. For some in Christian camping, in fact, for many, it's burnout. Because we know the schedules you work, particularly during the summer if you're doing summer camp. Sometimes it's staffing challenges, whether you're a director and you just can't find the right person or people, or sometimes you're on staff and there aren't enough of you. Sometimes it's financial struggles that threaten to take camps under. might even be personal financial struggles that you're facing. could be attendance or occupancy rates. One of the worst storms is discord. When, there, when there's strife between staff, whether it's you and your staff, whether it's if you're a director or it's board members, or uh, if, if you're not the, the boss, maybe it is stress with your, with your boss. If there's strife at home, or if, if your kids are in trouble, if they're in pain, or if they're having a crisis of faith, those are things that all cause us to, to look around and get distracted by, frightened by, and perhaps overwhelmed by the storm. Sometimes it's simply a personal battle that you're going through. Maybe your own little secret no one else knows about. And it's threatening to overtake you. Take you under. 
I'll tell you about a personal storm that I experienced a few years ago. It was May 9, 2012, and I'm a, mig- uh, I'm a migraine sufferer. Sorry, it was 2002. It was, uh, it was almost 13 years ago. I'm a migraine sufferer, and I had gone to a neurologist and, and said, my migraine symptoms are changing. I'm a little concerned. They don't present like they used to. And uh, he said, well, have you ever had an MRI? And I said, no, um, I haven't. He said, well, let's get a baseline MRI on your brain, and then we'll see if there's anything uh, going on there, and, and, and then we'll measure it from here forward. See if there's any brain waves going on there at all. I do have two staff members in the back of the room, and they're nodding like this. You know. uh, so, so I had gone in early in the morning, 7.30 for my MRI. I'm at my desk at 9 in the morning, and the phone rings. And the call goes something like this. Mr. Hunter, this is Nancy from Dr. Simsarian's office. There's an abnormality in your MRI. The doctor wants to see you first thing in the morning. The storm got pretty high at that moment. See, abnormality in your um, MRI might not be bad if they did a full body MRI, but they took from here up. (laughs) And then she said this. I kid you not. She said, I said, yes, I can be there first thing in the morning. She said, oh, wait, the doctor's out tomorrow. Can you come in Monday? (laughs) Little test of your faith. (laughs) Test of your patience with the doctor's office. Well, that journey... um, continued on that Monday morning when I went to the MRI lab, I picked up my films, and because the envelope had my name on it, I opened it, and I pulled out the MRI report, and I read a lot of stuff I didn't understand in medical jargon, Um, and then I got to the middle paragraph, and it says, we find a lesion in the middle of the cerebellum, one and a half by two and a half centimeters. We suspect a tumor of the type pilocytic astrocytoma. Ladies and gentlemen, I felt like I'd just read my death warrant. My wife and I had a friend in Seattle who was dying after two or three brain surgeries, um, wafers implanted, lovely young woman, eight or, eight or nine years younger than I, and Julie was dying, and I thought, now I know what I have to look forward to. In that moment, looking at that document, well... It, that uh, experience began several weeks of sending my MRI films all over the place because adults generally don't get tumors in the cerebellum. It, it's the balance and coordination center. So if you have a tumor there, often they, they find them in children who begin to stumble and fall and they can't stand upright or they're not coordinated. So they do the MRI and they find one there. So my films went everywhere. They, they went to Georgetown and Johns Hopkins, Mass General, Stanford, University of Washington, um, s- several places, and, and I got conflicting reports from the doctors. Half of them said, you ought to get in there and take that thing out right away. And the other half said, I don't think I would. I said, can't you biopsy it? They said, well, the thing is, that's such a sensitive area that even a needle biopsy can do as, as much damage as surgery. So we're, we, we, we don't recommend a biopsy. If you want to know what it is, we'll take it out and see. But you may not be able to walk. You may not be able to ride a bike, you may not even be able to speak. I'm a communicator and a writer and a a businessman and mostly a a father who wanted to play ball with his boys. I coached 17 seasons of youth sports, and I just wanted to be able to play with my kids. We fast forward about a month and a half. And while I had gone to these places, I'd been to to Georgetown and Johns Hopkins and Duke Medical Center, which is where I found a wonderful Christian neurosurgeon, and he gave me the advice, don't operate. First, first we asked him, um, what do you think about it? He said, well, I think we probably ought to take it out. And and, um, he said, a friend of his, talking about my case, said, what would you do if it was your brother? I said, well, I'd tell him to wait. He said, why would you tell a patient and your brother something different? So he said, let's just wait, and we'll, we'll take another MRI in, in a month and another MRI in, a, in another month, and we'll see what the doubling time is because that's what they measure tumors in. In the process of thinking I'm probably going to die, I'm, I'm driving in the country. I don't even um, enjoy country music that much, knowing that I'm speaking with camp people for whom that may be your favorite. <laughs> you know the song, Live Like You Were Dying? Never had heard it before. 
turn it on, and it says, I went skydiving, I went Rocky Mountain climbing, I went 2.7 seconds on a bull named Fu Manchu. And I said, you know what? And he said, one day I hope you get the chance to live like you were dying. And I said, wow, look at this, I have it. I have the chance to live like I was dying. And I'll tell you what, it, when he says, what, what, the next verse is, I, I, I love deeper and I sp spoke sweeter, I love sweeter, I spoke, what, right? So, so it, it softened some of the way that I talked to my boys. I remember uh, one night, what, my oldest son, Zach, was getting out of bed for the fourth time. And I said, Zach, I told you, I'll be right there, son, just a minute. I didn't want him to remember me as the unbending dad who demanded obedience regardless of whether he was scared in the night. It changed me. That storm had an impact on my life. But there was a moment when I, though it took weeks, Peter's response to the storm was instant when he began to speak. Mine took about between four and six weeks. I was driving to work one day and I said, okay, God, this is too much for me to handle. I don't feel all that stressed, but I, I don't want to dwell on this for however long I have left, dwell on the idea that I might be dying. So what happens if I go? Well, as a follower of Christ, I get my promotion early. I get to go be with the Lord who died for me so that I could be with him. It's that hope I've been holding on to since I was 17 at camp that I could be with Jesus. And I said, you know what? That's not so bad, is it? It's not so bad. I, I figuratively reached out like Peter did to say, Lord, save me. And he grabbed me and the, the storm went calm. Sometimes I think it's easier when it's catastrophic than it is with smaller storms. And we're going to talk about that just a little bit more. Sometimes when I tell my story, I forget to tell what happened. I'm ready to move on to the message because I know what happened. Uh, I'll just tell you this. I lived. Um, after doing repeated MRIs over a couple of months, then six months, and then a year, the tumor was not doubling at all. At some point in its history, the doctor said, you were not born with this. It's clear. We can tell from the physiology. But it stopped doubling. And I still have it. And it's still sitting there as a reminder to me that life is short. And I go in for an occasional MRI just to be sure, and it stays the same year after year after year. So I'm fine. No surgery, no medication, no chemo or anything like that. Now, my response to a storm isn't always that trusting, I have to confess. And particularly, as I said, the smaller storms are, are those annoying things that I think little by little the waves add up, and they will detract us and distract us from what God has us here for. My biggest challenge is in the day-to-day. At nights, sometimes, I wake up and I can't get back to sleep because I have so much spinning in my head. I might shower at 2 or 3 in the morning and go to the office just so I can accomplish something rather than lying there awake for the next 4 or 5 hours. What's your response to a storm? When something happens in your life, whether it's just a, a minor surprise, whether it's the brother or sister who tells you what they think of you, whether it's someone that says, you know, we've had a, we've had a, a budget cut and your salary will be cut, you don't know how you're going to make ends meet. I, I can think of several things that we do in general. One is that we tell somebody, right? The first thing we think of is, I got to call my husband. I got to call my wife. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk around the corner and tell somebody. Find someone to commiserate with. Sometimes we just whine right where we are. Just sit right where we are and have a pity party all on our own and say, man, I can't believe that happened to me again. Sometimes we look for someone else to attack or blame, because it's easier to, if we can say, that person caused me pain, and you know what? He's a jerk anyway. We feel better if our pain is someone else's fault. We can't bear the burden of our own problems. Sometimes we dismiss it. I call that the Scarlett O'Hara approach. Remember Scarlett? She says, you know, I'll think about that another day. I think the last line of Gone with the Wind is, after all, tomorrow is another day. Just think about it another time. Let's not deal with it. Sometimes we aggressively search for a solution. And if you're a leader or a type A personality in the room, sometimes that's the first thing you do. It's like the captain at the wheel or at the tiller of a ship. And the storm comes up and you're going to fight that thing for all you're worth. Sometimes, you know, they would just kind of tie it off and let it go. 
But we as leaders sometimes say, I'm going to find the solution. I want to find what we, we can do. I want to make this thing better. Or sometimes we cry out to the Lord like Peter did. Lord, save me. You'll notice that I mentioned that option last because often that's what we do last. And so I'm here to, to, today. My, my first spiritual discipline that I wanted to talk with you about uh, is to encourage us to cry out to the Lord first. Not just in the big storms, but to cry out to the Lord first, no matter how big or how small the storm may be. We've defined those storms as significant events or tragedies, but I see great growth in our relationship with God if we'll turn to Him when it's just a tornado watch, not a tornado warning. It's, well, there may be a storm coming, rather than waiting till it's on us and overtaking us. In the storm, cry out or call out to the Lord first. We need to practice this until it becomes reflex, like second nature. Like Peter in Matthew 14. I believe that we'll find peace in those storms when we seek God first, not relief from our trouble. But how counterintuitive. I mean, if, if, if your hand is on a flame, you, you, it, it's, it's reflex. We, we want to move ourselves out of the pain first. What if we called out to the Lord like Peter did, Lord, save me first? There was a time when my son, Zach, who's now 23, had double pneumonia when he was about two. And uh, we took him to an evening clinic, and they said, after listening to his lungs, they said, uh, okay, I want you to get in the car and drive right away to Children's Hospital Emergency Room. There's no air moving in this lung, and this lung is Im impeded, or whatever word they would have used. And I said, doctor, I'm no ambulance driver. Can you please treat him here? Is there anything you can do? And she said, Yes. They put him on a nebulizer. They, they decided they wanted to give him uh, injections of antibiotics right away because he had double pneumonia. As he was sitting there with me, and they, they gave him, he was so little, they put the injections in his thighs. And, and so he, he's sitting there facing me with his legs straddling mine, and he's just, he's grabbing onto me. He's saying, Daddy, please, no more pokes. <laughs> Broke my heart. But I was there for him like our daddy our Abba Father is there for us. If we just lean into him, he'll hold us and he'll comfort us. He'll give us what we need in that moment. What would it look like to handle even the minor storms this way, saying, Lord, help me? And by the way, what, what, if, what if Peter had chosen what we do often? What if he just decided to tell somebody? He's sinking. Instead of seeing Jesus and saying, Lord, save me, he says, hey, guys, look what's happening. Hey, look at me over here. I'm drowning. Does it, it doesn't even make sense, right? He reached to the one who could help him immediately. Some time ago, I, I received what I thought was a, a pretty critical email. And uh, there were several other camping people across the country who were CC'd on it. My response? I'm going to go see C Scott King. He's a director of operations for many years. He's retired now, but he'd been around 20 years. And Scott, had no, he knew and he had seen everything. And I started up uh, around, around the corner of my desk, and I went, you know what? I don't need to go see Scott King. I need to see the Lord first. And I went back and sat down. I said, okay, Lord, help me to practice what I preach. Lord, save me. Help me. Help me to know this wave is pretty disturbing to me. The, 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 this, this critical email sent to many. Would you consider making a commitment to try this, to, to call out to the Lord at the first hint of trouble? Maybe for the next two weeks, just say, you know what, I'm not going to either tell my spouse first, please share, share your challenges with your spouse, but I'm not going to tell them first, I'm not going to go tell my friend, I'm not going to tell my coworker. If, if, if I'm disturbed, bothered, hurt, burdened, the first person I'm going to go to is Jesus, like Peter, Lord, save me. Don't go to that person around the corner. But if you get anxious about it, then talk to him again. Yes, I think there's wisdom in many counselors. Proverbs 15, 22 tells us that, that plans fail for lack of counsel, but many advisors, with many advisors, they succeed. But I think we have to be honest and say, is that really what we're looking for? Uh, or do we just rush to tell someone so we can be heard, so we can commiserate, so we feel like someone's listening to us? 
If you have a self-control, go to the Lord first. Note, note this, that Jesus responded in this passage alone, responded immediately twice. The first one was when they were scared and they were in the boat, a bunch of uh, fishermen and, and, and uh, grown men crying maybe like little girls. It said, and they cried out in fear. Oh no, it's a ghost. And it says, immediately Jesus said, hey, chill, it's me. Immediately. He wasn't there to try to make them frightened. He wasn't there to prolong their pain. He was there for them immediately. The second one, of course, is Peter says, Lord, save me. And the, the, the scripture says, immediately Jesus reached his hand and pulled him up. This has become one of my most frequent prayers in recent years. And, and I, I practice this a lot. Sometimes if I'm lying in bed and I wake up, whether it's 2, 3, 4 in the morning... I literally will reach out my hand physically and I say, Lord, save me. Sometimes it's just an overwhelming amount of work that needs to be done. Sometimes it's a challenge that I don't know how I'm going to overcome. I, I literally will hold out my hand and say, Lord, save me. And I can imagine being where Peter was, reaching out his hand, sinking in the waves and being pulled up and taken to the boat by Jesus. The second spiritual discipline, challenge, in facing storms, is, is don't wait until the calm to worship. Don't wait until the storm has passed to acknowledge who he is and to praise him. I love being out in the woods or by a lake or by a river all alone. It's, it's, it's among my favorite times and experiences. Um, I, I, I experience real peace there, and I uh, have great conversations with God in those times. That kind of setting isn't always readily available, particularly in the midst of a storm. And we need to respond to the storm by worshiping God anyway, where we are. In Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas had an experience uh, that I would guess wasn't pleasant for them. They might have called it a storm. Paul had cast a demon out of a slave girl who predicted the future and made money for her slave owner. And so the owners got mad and uh, turned the community against Paul and Silas. They were stripped and beaten with rods. They were thrown into prison. They were guarded carefully in an inner cell with their feet fastened in stocks. A pretty bleak situation that I think none of us would like to be in. About, uh, in Acts 16.25, it says, About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, as you do when you're locked in an inner cell with your feet in stocks. But they did. And an earthquake comes, the doors fly open, the chains fall off, the jailer who's going to kill himself before the magistrates can do it is stopped by Paul and Silas. Ultimately, the jailer takes them to his house, makes dinner for them, and they all believed in God and rejoiced. People are watching the way we deal with our storms. In this case, it was a jailer and his whole family. It might be our, our own family. It might be our staff. It might be our neighbors. It might be non-believers. What a testimony if we'll reach out and cry out and sing out to God even in the storm. And that's not to say we are fake or phony or we don't let people know when we're struggling or suffering. But if we can cry out to God first and then praise him in the storm. Don't wait for the calm to praise. As a side note, some of us in ministry maybe in a season of prolonged storms that never seem to break. And what happens when we try to sing and praise and worship um, when we're in the dark cell in shackles is that it just feels empty. It feels fake to us. I was surprised when I heard of a Fuller Institute study from several years ago that said 90% of pastors said they frequently are fatigued and worn out on a weekly and even daily basis. And 71% of pastors say they constantly fight depression. And in a room this size, that wouldn't be a surprise to, to you. Those who serve are often those who feel deeply and are surrounded by our own feelings and emotions that swirl in ways that are difficult for us to imagine, difficult for us to deal with. More than 70% of pastors say they didn't have anyone they considered a true friend. 70%. So sometimes in ministry, 
It's lonely. Sometimes it's dark, like in that inner cell. My challenge to us is that we don't wait for the calm to worship. But like Paul and Silas, we worship God anyway for who he is, not for who we are, not for our circumstances at the moment. We worship God for who he is. The third discipline is don't let the storm steal your joy because it can quickly. Don't let the storm steal your joy. You know the story about Nehemiah and the rebuilding of the wall. I won't tell the the whole story, but in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, it says this, and this is after they'd found the scriptures and were reading them publicly. It says, people were weeping as they listened to the reading of the word. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. For several years, that was hard for me to understand. And as I dug into it, I said, the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord makes you strong. Well, you know what? The joy of the Lord is not like a vitamin, not like protein powder that helps me build muscle. The joy of the Lord is the muscle. It is my muscle. So when I have joy in the Lord, even in the storm, I will be strong. That's what Nehemiah is saying, is, is, is do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. When we look at Romans 8, 28, another one of the most quoted verses in Scripture, in all things God works for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. If we know that that's true, we believe that that's fact, then we can, even when we're in pain, even when we're in discomfort, maintain the joy of the Lord by, by praising him in the midst of the storm. James 1 says, Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, not lacking anything. Sometimes the storm is what causes us to fall to our knees. Sometimes it's what causes us to reach out to him. And there's no better place to be than holding the hand of Jesus in the storm so he can take us back to the boat where the waves are calm. Now, if if you ask yourself, would you trade in a painful experience from your past? You were in pain in the distant past. Would Would you trade in that experience? Well, most of the time I can say no, depending on how far distant it is. I have to be honest with you. If you ask me, okay, that thing you experienced a year ago, would you trade that in? I might say yeah in a heartbeat. Because the pain still resides. It hasn't become a scar yet that I don't feel anymore. But what that tells me is that if I give it time, trust in the Lord, hold on to him, don't lose my joy, that that pain too shall pass, and it'll be something that I will be glad and not trade in because I learned from it that I can trust God, and I learned many other things. I know from experience that even in the midst of a storm, we can experience a depth of joy like that. Um, And and it's it's like peace that passes understanding. For two years, I mentored a young man in his 20s who was given a year to live in April of 2011. And he passed away in April 2013, one year longer than, than he was given by the doctors. The storm he faced may be more dramatic than some of us will ever face. But he, Ryan, enjoyed a productive, rewarding life undergirded by a joy in the Lord that was undeniable. And he was such an amazing testimony and witness to his whole community who knew him and knew his battle, knew that he was only 26 and then 27 going through this. He was a wonderful young man, and he never let the storm, cancer, steal his joy. In closing, I'll point you to Psalm 107. And it's a great passage of scripture about four groups of people who each do something or experience something. Generally, it's outside the will of God. Something bad happens to them. They cry out to God and he brings relief. The next group does something they shouldn't have done. Bad circumstances happen. They cry out to God and God brings them relief. And then in verse 26, Psalm 107, this is about a group who went to sea as merchants on the mighty waters in a huge storm. Or a tempest comes up. Verse 26 says, In their peril, their courage melted away. 
They reeled and staggered like drunkards. They were at their wit's end. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm, and he guided them to their desired haven. When storms come, cry out to the Lord first. Don't wait until the calm to worship, and don't let the storm steal your joy. Remember the words that I shared in the beginning. Jesus has promised, John 16, 33, in this world you will have trouble. I didn't finish the verse, did I? He says, but take heart or be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. And with his help, we can too. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you're always with us, that you're standing there to help immediately. Thank you that we can lean on you, depend on you, trust in you. Help us to do that. Lord, be on the forefront of our minds that when we're enduring a storm that we think might take us under, that we would say to you, Lord, save me, or Lord, help me. God, help us to praise you in the midst of this storm anyway. And God, please continue to give us your joy no matter what we're going through so we can be most effective for you in your work. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.